Heart disease is the number one cause of death for both men and women, but with advances in medicine, surgical techniques, education, and prevention, more people with heart disease are surviving. I sat down with Dr. David Deaton, a cardiac surgeon at Bay State Medical Center, and his patient, Peter Zimmerman, to learn more about what can be done to protect yourself and your loved ones. So heart disease encompasses a, a, a large number of diagnoses, various diagnoses and includes ischemic heart disease, which is coronary artery disease. It also includes valvular heart disease, which includes aortic and mitral for the most part, um, either stenosis or leaking um, um, on those valves. And then the third category would be uh, cardiomyopathy. And this is a situation where the heart muscle itself uh, doesn't have the strength to, to squeeze, to push the blood. And uh, oftentimes treatments for that includes things like uh, heart transplant or left ventricular assist devices. Do you think that people realize that it's the leading cause of death for both men and women? It's been in the lay press quite a bit, and I think a lot of people do realize that it's a big killer, but a lot of people don't realize how, how it may affect them. And uh, a lot of people think that just because I exercise, just because I think I'm eating right, that they're going to be immune to these things. It's fairly common that I will have a patient who asks me, doctor, I did everything right. Why me? Right. Uh, and um, and it's, uh, it is partly what we do, but it's also partly our genetic component. Um, and so uh, it, it, it can affect even people who seemingly have no risk factors. Okay, so let's talk about uh, you, Peter. Tell me a little bit about your story and how you both met. I retired in 2014, and six months after I retired, I was in the hospital with congestive heart failure. And at that point, I met uh, Dr. Stephen DePillo, my cardiologist. And then up until the time of my surgery in August, was seeing Dr. DePillo fairly regularly and having cardioversions, I developed AFib, and we were doing okay with it, but nothing was really changing. And it wasn't until uh, early in the summer of last year that a couple of things happened. I guess the most significant was that I, I'm an active person. I like to bike. I like to canoe and kayak and garden and do a lot of those things. And I was getting incredibly tired. I would rebuild a stone wall and you know every 10 minutes I was sitting down to rest and we did a stress test and I guess that's that was really the determining factor and then uh, after the results were looked at I ended up going to Bay State and I met with Dr. Islam who did a cardiac catheterization and that's when I think a lot of the issues started to show up and doctor, and that's when I met Dr. Deaton, and he came in and spoke to my wife and I. It was a good chat and a real eye opener. So tell me about his surgery, because he, as he was just describing, you know, his lifestyle, very fit, very active, certainly not the person that you would think, you know, would run into trouble. What was the surgery like? Well, he, he illustrates one of the th problems that we have with coronary artery disease in particular, and. Uh, is that not everybody gets the classic symptoms of chest pain, pain down the arm, but he was experiencing dyspnea on exertion um, or, or shortness of breath with, with exertion. Some people do not get the chest pain at all. And so it was uh, good that his cardiologist recognized the, um, uh, the, 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 he had had some treatments before and they hadn't really had the anticipated effects. And so he did the extra step of a stress test. And what that showed was he had extensive coronary disease. Uh, we also knew that he had a little bit of an enlarged aorta based on, a, based on an echocardiogram. But it, it didn't seem to be as, as large as it turned out to be in the, operation, in the operating room. When we took him to the operating room, we were going to address the atrial fibrillation, which was one of the things that had been treated before. That's a rapid irregular heartbeat that, ha that occurs. And we were also going to do bypasses, and we had planned to do five because he had extensive narrowings. And uh, in the operating room, then, we discovered that his ascending aorta and aortic root 
were enlarged to the point where we couldn't leave those behind without addressing them. Had he shown up in my office with the findings on his aorta isolated in an isolated fashion, we probably wouldn't have operated on him at that point in time. But because we were there to do the other stuff, we couldn't really leave it behind because it would change his risks in the future and it would likely be that we might have to address the aorta in the next year or two years, which would have been um, uh, an additional risk uh, um, to, to, to him in the future that we could address at this time. I felt like I could do the entire operation and do it safely, so we uh, stepped out of the operating room, had a discussion with his wife, because it was going to include replacing his aortic valve, which we hadn't, right. hadn't planned on, and replacing the first part of the aorta. Uh, it ended up being a rather lengthy operation, but... Uh, what is lengthy? Well, I, I remember about 10 to maybe 11 hours, something like that, but... Um, it, I wasn't wife, keeping track. You, you, were, you weren't <laughs> awake, so you... Um, so it was, it was much longer. It should have been like a five or six op hour operation, right. but to add to everything that we did. How, it, how has medicine changed in the last 20 years or so as far as the advances um, that have been made, you know, surgical advances? There's a lot of things that we can do uh, now that we couldn't do before. We had, in the, uh, in 20 years ago, we didn't think we could keep the heart arrested for as long as we can. We now can feel uh, that we have a greater margin for safety for most, most patients to accomplish complicated operations. And then there are a lot of things we can do without actually operating on patients. There are alternative treatments to some of these disease processes, such as aortic stenosis and TAVRs, such as... Um, certain types of angioplasty. Uh, we have devices that can support the heart without opening the chest so that the uh, complicated uh, high-risk angioplasties can be done in certain pa patient populations. Um, we, have, um, we have the ability for some aneurysms to, to instead of replacing them, we actually um, exclude them from the circulation by putting stent grafts into the descending aorta or into, into the abdominal aorta. So there's, there's a really um, wide variety of things we can do. The, one of the ones that's in this community that's uh, really on the cutting edge is uh, something called a mitral clip. This is a way to fix the mitral valve without having an open heart operation. Uh, and then um, one of the uh, other technologies that are being brought on board here um, is the left ventricular assist device, which is an artificial heart type of um, mechanical blood pump that's implanted. So um, all of these things are, are, are things that we have here at Bay State that are really uh, new and, um, and are not available uh, in many places uh, other than you know, big places, big, and places. big, big places. Big cities. What is your advice you know, to other people who, who might be watching, um, just as far as not only taking care of yourself, because it sounded like you were, but just about symptoms as well, to kind of trust you know, what pay, you're feeling? Yeah. <clears throat> pay attention seek advice, and, uh, and then follow up on it. I, um, yeah, I had the disadvantage, I guess, of not knowing my family roots. So there wasn't, there wasn't sort of that red flag that said, oh, yeah, my grandfather had that or my dad had that. Um, but I was very pleased that, and, and very thankful that we were able to address these issues, and I had good doctors um, before it became a real problem.